Hi everyone, I'd like to thank you for joining today's webinar. This is a re-recording of a webinar that took place on November 17th, and I apologize for the audio trouble that we had for those who listened to it live on the 17th. Today we're hoping that everything is resolved. I'm Megan Houston with the Institute for Market Transformation, and I'll be beginning today's presentation before turning it over to Nikhil Nadkarni with the City of Cambridge. And we're going to finish the webinar with a dedicated time for questions and answers. Today I'm going to be presenting findings from IMT's recent report that we just published called Catalyzing Efficiency, Unlocking Energy Information and Value in Apartment Buildings. And I'm going to be talking about how governments and efficiency program implementers can take action to help transform the multifamily building stock into a more efficient sector. Before getting started on the report, I just want to first off thank the MacArthur Foundation for their generous support of our work. So we really appreciate all, the, all, all that they provided us throughout the, this past year and a half. To begin with, we look at why buildings matter. IMT works to improve energy efficiency in the built environment. Our work focuses on buildings, as does much of your work, because that's where the energy is. Each year, U.S. buildings use more energy than most countries, and Americans spend about $400 billion to heat and cool and power their buildings. Now we look at why apartments matter and why IMT focused on uh, the apartment sector for this report. There are about 18.7 million households who rent in multifamily buildings, and about, which is about 39 million Americans. Within this sector, there's a huge affordability disparity. Half of the households pay more than 30% of their income on housing, and that means that it's a significant burden on those renters and it's not affordable. Additionally, percentage-wise, low-income households in big cities pay twice as much of their income on utilities as median-income households. So this shows when uh, utility costs are impacting households, why it's a, an important sector to focus on for reducing expenses. The core energy efficiency policy that IMT supports is the benchmarking and transparency of buildings' energy use. By benchmarking, we mean measuring a building's energy use and then comparing it to the average for similar buildings. This allows owners and occupants to understand how their buildings are performing, and it helps them identify ways that they can cut out energy waste. Benchmarking also helps the market, the overall market, understand how the building is doing. By sharing this data, it can also help the market recognize and reward energy efficiency and then this will create a continuous cycle of improvement and demand for high-performing buildings. So back in 2012, IMT looked at how benchmarking and transparency policies were affecting the multifamily sector. This was a time when there were very few jurisdictions with benchmarking and transparency policies, and even uh, less that applied directly to multifamily buildings. And what we found was that even though there was this potential uh, billions of dollars in energy savings, that property owners just didn't have enough data about their energy use, and the market had no real indication of what their buildings were doing and how buildings were performing. Since that report, a lot more jurisdictions have implemented benchmarking and transparency policies, and many of those do apply to multifamily. So the current tally is 12 cities in the state of New California have policies that apply to the multifamily sector, with Portland, Maine being the most recent city to enact a law for multifamily buildings. So recognizing that more jurisdictions have policies that get this data into this market, IMT looked at whether the multifamily stakeholders are using this data and how they're using it and what is the impact of this data. And what we found is that the impact of this data is still in its infancy in driving change. So there are some jurisdictions that have implemented benchmarking and transparency policies and they're actually collecting data on multifamily buildings so they've been in existence long enough to actually get that data. There are other, are other jurisdictions that have policies but who aren't collecting data yet because it's just too new and working on being implemented. And then there are many just jurisdictions 
that just don't have policies that address multifamily buildings at all. The report that we're presenting, Catalyze and Efficiency, recommends ways that governments and energy program implementers can help multifamily stakeholders work together to use and value building performance data effectively in consistent formats, in transparent for formats. And this hopefully will realize better energy and water efficiency opportunities. And by saying energy or efficiency program implementers, what we mean are organizations that are dedicated to increasing efficiency in certain areas, mainly through customer engagement. These are often utilities, but many nonprofits and for-profit groups uh, participate in these programs as well. Some examples include PG&E, NYSERDA, and Elevate Energy. So this is a slide that many people are familiar with uh, regarding the challenges here. And this is what faces the multifamily sector. The first two, lack of data and lack of awareness, are really where benchmarking and transparency programs focus on. So how can we get the data out there? How can we make people aware of what, they, what they're using, what they're, how their buildings are performing? This slide also shows that there are other challenges facing the multifamily sector, present, preventing energy efficiency from being realized. And it shows that benchmarking and transparency policies really need to be combined with other programs to drive efficiency because this market is so nuanced and because of all the challenges. Um, so it needs to be combined with other programs that will address the, the last four barriers and others as well. This slide here looks at what an ideal market, how an ideal market would shape out. And benchmarking and transparency policies provide information to the market that will drive action to greater efficiency. And this shows how information will be the interplay between different se sectors and the information and how it is uh, transmitted throughout these groups. So in the top left bubble, we have governments and efficiency program implementers, and they help get the data to the market. Um, they also help owners and managers analyze, interpret, and act upon the data through creating programs that drive efficiency. So it's this give and take relationship between owners and managers and governments and implementers. They also help give this data to residents, lenders, and investors um, by putting it out into the market. In the bottom bubble, owners and managers have the greatest influence over actual building consumption since they're the ones making the final decisions and they actually execute retrofit operations and maintenance measures that will eventually lead to continuously improving their building performance. In the top right bubble, we have residents, lenders, and investors, and this group, ideally out of self-interest, would use building performance data to make decisions that benefit themselves. For example, um, if they select high-performance buildings, their utility bills will be lower, or they'll have increased comfort or reduced risk, and this will drive them to demand efficiency. By demanding efficiency, they're going to motivate owners and managers to implement efficiency that will in turn attract residents and investors and also secure the best loans. And this cycle would ideally lead to owners and residents saving billions of dollars in the efficiency alone. Now of course the real world doesn't look like this right now and this report recommends ways that governments and efficiency program implementers can help stakeholders overcome these existing hurdles to wider adoption of energy and water efficiency. So this report focuses on governments and efficiency program implementer actions, but it's important to note that every stakeholder does have a role to play in using building performance data to drive efficiency, and each stakeholder will have its own sphere of control. In this example that we're looking at now, a city's government has actions within its control, influence, or interest. So things within the sphere of control are where there's a direct correlation between a city's actions and the impact. And as we move outward from sphere of influence to sphere of interest, the relationship between that action and that impact becomes more indirect. As a city, or any other stakeholder for that matter, um, 
has limited resources, you should prioritize and target first those actions within your control before addressing other recommendations. For example, you should work to improve data quality, which is in that control bubble, before working with owners and managers to market high-performing apartments, which is in the sphere of interest. This report frames actions for working with three different types of stakeholders. The first being owners and managers, the second being residents, and the third being lenders and investors. What we're looking at now is best practices for how governments and efficiency program implementers can work with owners and managers to use building performance data more effectively to drive efficiency. First, governments and implementers should improve benchmarking compliance communications. This is just this is includes data access, which uh, examples would be pair benchmarking and utility access legislation together, as California has done, and also include data access guidance when you're trying to get owners and managers to comply with your, with your benchmarking rules, as Washington, D.C. does. But it also means data intelligence. So what is the data telling owners and managers? Because we want to see benchmarking up compliance be, go beyond just compliance and actually drive action. And what IMT found when working with the Institute for Real Estate Management, IRAM, where we surveyed owners and managers about how they approach sustainability, is that owners and managers predominantly use local level scale data to make energy comparisons. For specifics, 81% of them that were surveyed use previous data for that property and only 11% use national performance data when they're making comparisons. This means that owners want local and individual context when reviewing their energy use intensity or energy star score. So if you're trying to connect owners and managers and give them reports on how they're performing, it might make more sense to offer local comparisons and say this is how you're performing over your peers rather than this is how you're doing nationally based on an energy star score. For example, Seattle's benchmarking dashboard will let owners compare their building's energy performance to similar buildings in Seattle based on what owners are submitting to the city in the benchmarking data laws. The tool will incorporate building type, height, and age as well, so owners can feel like they're getting a good snapshot of how their building is performing compared to similar uh, physical attributes as well. Another example that you see in the bottom left corner of the screen is the NYSEEC Efficiency Calculator, where the tool uses energy benchmarking data to predict a building's energy and cost savings. This tool is tailored for that particular building, which helps motivate owners to capitalize on those savings. And again, like Seattle, each building is grouped with New York City comparables based on age, height, and this time including affordability. The second best practice is to improve data quality. And what we found is that there is some uh, questioning over whether the data is accurate. And we know that the data is only useful as it is accurate. It's critical that governments and efficiency program implementers assure that this data that they're providing, that owners are giving, and that um, cities are publishing is credible data. You should implement data quality standards, checklists, education, training, and um, other tools to make sure that uh, what you're getting is good quality. Finally, and the biggest one here in this category, is that governments and implementers should create programs to drive action. A big misconception about benchmarking data that we found is that owners and managers think that it should always tell them what to do, and this isn't necessarily true. But we interviewed owners and managers from both affordable and market rate sectors who were frustrated because they invested so much time and um, energy into benchmarking all their properties and then they got the results and they say, well, now what? Now what do I do? This doesn't tell me how to actually move forward. And it's important to understand that benchmarking is a foundational step to achieving greater savings. However, owners and managers want to see that connection from how to move from benchmarking to making energy and water improvements. A best practice here is for governments and implementers to use building performance data to understand owner needs and then create comprehensive programs 
that help make that connection for this group. For example, you should use data to analyze building stock and then tailor your programs accordingly. And Nikhil will be talking more later in this uh, webinar about how Cambridge Energy Alliance is using benchmarking data to target its out target outreach and uh, connect its multifamily owners to its programs. You should also help owners and managers take data and turn it into action. An example here is the New York City Retrofit Accelerator where they're taking benchmarking data and finding out and figuring out what it's telling them, um, including with their energy audit laws, and then offering technical assistance to do energy and water efficiency programs. Finally, some jurisdictions may want to consider implementing mandatory building performance standards. This is more rare, and the city of Austin is the main, if not only, jurisdiction doing this. But their Austin Energy, um, they're connected with Austin Energy, which runs the city's benchmarking and audit policy. And if the building, if the building energy use is greater than 150% of the average Austin multifamily building, then that building has to improve their energy performance by 20%. Moving on to how um, governments and implementers can help engage residents, this section does describe more opportunities to work with market rate residents as this sector has more opportunity to express their market rate preferences but the other slides do uh, address both affordable and market rate sectors. The best practices here are about giving residents the tools to demand, um, to show that they demand energy efficiency and water efficiency. First, governments and implementers should work with owners and managers to help residents use benchmarking data while they are apartment shopping. We know that owners pay attention to resident preferences very carefully, and they try to give residents what they want. That's their business. This is why we're seeing things like pet spas and fitness on demand gyms and all kinds of amenities. Currently, residents don't have the opportunity to express their preferences for energy and water efficiency because this information just isn't in the normal transaction, the normal process of how a resident will shop for an apartment. Because it's not the normal business practice, Owners and managers think that residents don't care about energy efficiency as much as other amenities, and they don't invest as heavily in this area. Now, there are some exceptions here. For example, um, Austin and Austin Energy require owners and managers to provide residents, prospective residents, with an energy guide before they sign the lease. And this energy guide does show the monthly estimated electric bill for a typical apartment in that building. But in general, residents and prospective residents just don't know how their energy usage compares to others, and, um, and that's a big problem in the market. One potential game changer here is a partnership between the U.S. Department of Energy and CoStar, which was announced in May at the Better Building Summit, where CoStar has agreed to begin to show energy performance through its online platform. CoStar owns Apartments.com, who is the top on online apartment listing website, and we're hopeful that if Apartments.com later includes this data, then residents would have access to this information in the interface that they typically use to apartment shop. This would allow a part, um, potential residents and current residents the ability to use energy and factor energy just as they would any other amenity. Second, governments and implementers should work with owners to help provide, promote high-performing market rate apartments to establish this resident demand. The market currently perceives a lack of resident demand for efficiency, as I previously mentioned, and this is a, this is a real uh, missed opportunity here to drive efficiency. Owners, governments, and efficiency program implementers should work together to develop programs that would allow the market to realize and measure and track how much the, that residents value efficiency as an amenity. And here, IMT is exploring a pilot uh, in, the early, in the early 2017 where we're looking at how owners could offer renters efficiency packages that owners would install at the owner's cost and then charge residents for the efficiency amenity services. This pilot would let owners track how residents value 
efficiency based on rent, premiums, comfort, lease ups, and turnover. So stay tuned for that. Finally, we're looking at how governments and efficiency program implementers can engage the lenders and investors in this multifamily sector. First, you should consider engaging them to use energy and water performance data. A best practice is for lenders and investors to use energy and water performance data in their standard business operations, which would give them better insight into how their portfolios are performing. So by benchmarking data, this includes metrics that, such as Energy Star scores. And a score like an Energy Star score is effective for communicating a simple metric that lenders and investors can use um, to evaluate how their performance, how their portfolios are doing. Yet only a few innovative lenders are actually incorporating this data into, into their standard operations. For example, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, recently announced that they are proposing energy and water benchmarking requirements. And if the rule goes through, then HUD assisted properties and public housing will soon benchmark their energy and water consumption and share this data with HUD. HUD will intend to use this data to monitor consumption trends, assess its efficiency needs, and develop um, financial and technical assistance based on that data, which is a great step. Another example is Community Preservation Corporation a New York City or New York State, excuse me, CDFI that uses benchmarking throughout its all of its operations. They benchmark all of their properties and they underwrite half of the projected energy savings into the mortgage. By doing so, this allows CPC to adjust the utility expense, which increases the income, and that lets an owner get a larger loan to pay for energy and water conservation measures. So governments and implementers should consider working with their lender community to share what they're doing with building performance data and find out how it may be useful to lenders and investors. Second, governments and implementers should encourage lenders and investors to improve product offerings to incentivize efficiency. Here we want to see um, this group encourage the lenders and investors to use benchmarking data at a minimum. So for example, New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development, HPD, created a retrofit financing program for small and medium multifamily buildings. And to join the program, it requires its lending partners to underwrite for projected energy efficiency savings. Another example is in the city of Chicago, where a public partnership, a public private partnership called Energy Savers, um, is working with Community Investment Corporation. CIC here will underwrite all of the projected savings from pr proposed building retrofits, and this has been working out very well for them as since 2008, they've distributed about $27.5 million in loans, and their loan losses have been less than 0.3%, which is very low. Another option is that governments may want to work with their housing finance agencies to update their qualified allocation plans. We know that the low income housing tax credit is a big driver for building affordable housing in the United States. And each state will develop their own qualified allocation plan to, de to determine how they're gonna allocate the tax credits each year. Um, for the state governments on the, who are listening, you should consider modifying your QAPs to re reward developers and owners who are actively managing their energy use by benchmarking their properties. So this webinar is the first in a uh, four-part series where each will target different audiences. And um, we're showing the dates here so you can save the date. And we hope that we see you there and that you join and share this with others in your network. We're also going to be releasing a series of blogs that will talk about the findings and target different owners or different stakeholders, excuse me, including owners and managers and lenders and investors. And then Finally, we'll be promoting this work through presentations and panels, so please stay tuned and um, follow along with what we're doing throughout the next few months. And now I'd like to turn this presentation over to Nikhil.
My name is Nikhil Nidkarni. I'm an energy planner with the City of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and I work on some of our multifamily energy efficiency initiatives. Um, and want to take a couple of minutes to talk about how we're using data to inform those. So I wanted to start off with a quick look at our multifamily landscape, you know, what the buildings are like, uh, a quick touch on the Georgetown University Energy Prize, which is kind of the foundation for some of the pilots that we're trying in the sector this year, uh, look at our data and benchmarking ordinance, and then really focus on two uh, one-year pilots that we are currently uh, launching and managing, uh, the Cambridge LegalWise pilot, uh, you know, closely connected with the topic of the next webinar, and uh, our what we're calling a Cambridge heating tune-up pilot. So for many years, Cambridge has taken a leadership role on energy and climate action. Uh, so back in 2002, we passed a climate protection action plan to set a target of 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Uh, in 2010, we were designated as a Massachusetts green community, which as some of you may know, requires um, <clears throat> uh, aggressive municipal energy efficiency action, as well as the adoption of a stringent energy code. Uh, around the same time, we founded the Cambridge Energy Alliance to do community-based outreach to residents and small businesses. Um, and in the past few years, we've fostered and facilitated the creation of the Kendall Square Eco District, uh, which is a uh, commitment among institutions and businesses in uh, one of the biggest biotech and research centers on the East Coast uh, to facilitate sustainability. Um, similarly, we've uh, facilitated the Compact for a Sustainable Future, which is which started off between Harvard, MIT, and the city on long-term sustainability goals, but has since uh, incorporated several other large uh, employers and organizations. But perhaps most uh, importantly, last year we adopted a net zero plan uh, so the Net Zero Action Plan uh, works on eliminating, reducing and eliminating the greenhouse gas emissions from our buildings, which uh, are responsible for 80% of Cambridge's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and it's a mix of efficiency and renewables to achieve a 70% a 70 reduction by 2040 uh, and being on track to be fully in net zero by mid-century. Uh, and so the graph at the bottom of the pie chart indicates the mix of reductions, uh, the, the relative size of the reductions that we anticipate our strategies will achieve between now and 2040. And you can see that residential retrofits, uh, so you know, upgrades to existing buildings, are responsible for more reductions, uh, significantly more reductions than uh, improvements to commercial code for new construction um, or on-site renewables throughout the city. So when we talk about reducing energy use in multifamily buildings through pilots and, and other strategies, we're really looking at that context of the long term of how we get to a point where we're getting multifamily buildings to net zero in the next 25 years. So the question is, what you know, what sort of buildings are we talking about here? And Cambridge is a very dense city. We're about uh, 110,000 people in six miles, give or take six square miles. So just 7% of our housing units are single family homes, um, and 64% of our units are in five unit plus buildings. Uh, additionally, 27% of our units are in condo ownership. So like uh, you know, Megan uh, mentioned, uh, multifamily buildings uh, have a number of energy efficiencies or structural challenges that we see. They're split incentives not only between the tenant and the, the owner, but in many cases uh, between condo unit owner and condo association. Uh, we see challenges of ownership uh, where parties that want to take the energy action are uh, rarely going to have the agency to, to upgrade the building themselves. Um, and finally, we see a lot of master metered heat and hot water in Cambridge multifamily buildings, uh, which, which can be you know, a point of leverage to implement some programs, but it also translates to tenants and unit owners having less of a direct incentive to uh, conserve energy in their units uh, when the association or the landlord is paying for those in bulk. So given these challenges that we see across basically 93% of our housing, uh, new initiatives that tackle these barriers are going to be really critical going ahead. So 
the data that we are using here is, uh, you know, the, the foundation, uh, like uh, Megan said, is using benchmarking data to inform a program. So in 2014, Cambridge enacted uh, and implemented the Building Energy Use Disclosure Ordinance. Uh, so similar to those other cities, it requires the use of portfolio manager uh, for annual benchmarking reporting by uh, the largest buildings in the city. Uh, for multifamily, that's 50 units and up, and on the CNI side, any building over 25,000 square feet is required to uh, benchmark and report. Um, thanks to the hard work of uh, several of my colleagues here, we have a 95% compliance rate, and in the multifamily sector, that translates to about 130 multifamily buildings uh, providing energy, water, and greenhouse gas metrics uh, to the city each year, and disclosure just began this fall. So if we look at some of the takeaways uh, from the first year of data, you can see that multifamily housing, um, fifth from the left, is not you know, the most energy intensive uh, type of building in the city, but the range uh, within the sector is still quite significant. Uh, so 7.7 .7 represents um, the fact that the most energy intensive multifamily buildings are using about seven times the uh, energy per square foot as their least energy intensive counterparts. The final piece of context here is the Georgetown University Energy Prize, and some of you may be quite familiar with this, uh, but this is a $5 million challenge that was issued by Georgetown University to communities to cut their energy use uh, in sort of a short you know, sprint, a relatively focused time frame of just two years from the beginning of 2015 to the end of 2016. Uh, and whichever community wins, uh, not only based on energy reduction, but also on the quality of their initiatives, will uh, be awarded $5 million. So we're competing with these 49 other cities across the country, um, and the focus of the competition is really on replicable, equitable, and innovative efficiency strategy. So when we are trying new things out, uh, trying new pilots out, uh, the Georgetown Prize is really sort of the context in which they're happening, but we view them as an opportunity to try new things that could be scalable in the future, both within our community and, and to other communities. So let me start off by talking about the Cambridge WeGoWise pilot. Um, so, you know, like uh, IMT's report chronicles, benchmarking alone uh, in and of itself does not immediately drive engagement action from, from all buildings. You know, I've, I've seen that some buildings absolutely uh, sort of have their eyes opened by the fact that if they uh, you know, got a certain energy star score, um, but that's not the case for everyone. Um, so we need to provide buildings a better understanding of their performance. And in particular, we wanted to really make sure we were engaging those buildings that have less capacity for energy management, right? Uh, the large institutions that might have a large, uh, you know, sustainability staff of multiple people or a uh, multinational property manager that has a dedicated sustainability team, um, that's great. What, what do we do about the ones that don't have the capacity to really take on energy management um, at that uh, institutionalized level? So we go wise, um, you know, not to, not to provide too much of a spoiler for the December webinar, but it's a Boston-based tech company offering a very easy-to-use energy tracking and management platform. Um, they provide monthly reports on patterns in energy use, you know, identifying spikes in heating, for example, uh, and sort of comparative performance metrics. So Cambridge is sponsoring for one year uh, a free WeGoWise account and retrofit support services uh, for uh, multifamily buildings. Uh, this in, the retrofit support services includes uh, a service beyond sort of just the account where uh, WeGoI staff is checking in with the property manager to help them get started in the system, uh, to help them identify spikes, um, and to really make sure that they're connected to the efficiency programs out there. So we're fortunate to be in a state where the utilities have um, extensive efficiency programs and rebates, and WeGoWise staff is really providing that sort of um, hand-holding or one-on-one -on -one support to make sure property managers are aware of the correct opportunities to take advantage of. And we're providing this for 32 buildings free of charge. 
Uh, we heard a lot about WeGoWise from our affordable housing partners in Cambridge who do uh, amazing work on, on their own buildings. And they had used the opportunity to, uh, through the Massachusetts Low Income Energy Affordability Network, known as LEAN, uh, to use WeGoWise. And we've heard that they are able to detect leaks uh, in, in their water systems, uh, measure the results of retrofits that they've taken, um, and really when working with a large portfolio to be able to identify the least efficient buildings very quickly. So we kicked off the program in July and we wanted to make sure we were addressing the, the sort of underperforming multifamily buildings. Uh, so we utilized the 2015 and 2016 benchmarking reports, uh, looked at Energy Star scores and EUIs, and WeGoWise staff prioritized sort of the the target buildings, right? Looking at sort of the lowest performers there. Um, we conducted outreach through email, mail, and existing networks. And um, after after a few weeks, after targeting those sort of lowest performer buildings, uh, for in a, you know, I'll, I'll get to the reasoning in just a second, but we expanded the pilot to all buildings over 30 units that were interested. So in terms of implementation, uh, buildings received extensive help in getting set up. So they only really needed to provide their utility account numbers, and then WeGoWise staff would take it from there. Uh, some buildings, especially those that aren't covered by the benchmarking ordinance, uh, needed to provide a little bit more information on square footage and uses, and you know things that we're familiar with. Uh, but WeGoWise staff is providing one-on-one -on -one help and phone calls and uh, offering in-person visits uh, to get them started. Each building has a personal dashboard and receive those monthly check-ins and receive uh, performance uh, performance reports that they can share with their uh, executive team. And again, uh, you know, we're in the stage where now we're starting to see uh, WeGoWise staff providing that sort of tailored um, recommendation to, to buildings based on the programs that are out there, uh, you know, identifying a good direct install lighting program from our utility partner that could make sense for a building, uh, things like that. So, so far, we've seen that the program was uh, largely subscribed by late September. Uh, buildings were okay with the data sharing with WeGoWise, but uh, more importantly, we are um, including a sort of a waiver in part that if you participate in the WeGoWise program, your data is also shared with the city. Um, and buildings that are benchmarking under the ordinance and buildings that aren't benchmarking in the, under the ordinance, uh, they were all fine with that. Uh, several of the larger organizations we find already use WeGoWise or, or similar product. So part of the reason we expanded the scope, uh, sort of the eligibility of the program, was because of our 44 initial uh, priority buildings, um, 20 of them were already using WeGoWise. Uh, beyond that, we've seen participation by uh, some larger organizations, uh, many smaller property managers as well. Uh, one of the surprises has been that the limited bandwidth of property managers, even with all of the support that WeGoWise is offering, can really result in a, in a longer setup time, uh, sort of a longer onboarding process than we anticipated that people are interested. But then uh, getting their account numbers together and sort of making sure they set aside enough time to have a check-in with WeGoWise, uh, that's been a, a more protracted process than we anticipated. Uh, and so we'll be evaluating the data that comes back from the buildings and uh, also you know, looking at some of the more uh, qualitative uh, outcomes and evaluating the outcomes of the pilot next year. So let me transition to the Cambridge Heating Tune-Up pilot. So as uh, as we've talked about before and as IMP has chronicled, you know, there's this uh, ability to perhaps engage buildings with some very easy energy efficiency, right? Sort of get uh, the low-hanging fruit as, as a means of uh, a pathway to deeper efficiency. So heating tune-up, um, for the purposes of this pilot, is a fine-grained calibration of existing heating controls. So this is not installing new controls or installing new thermostats or aquastats or anything like that, uh, but tuning the existing system to provide greater efficiency um, and, as, as we marketed, avoiding overheating and tenant comfort issues. Uh, so this was an important thing for us to pitch to many of the master metered buildings in Cambridge where you know, overheating is, is definitely a, a common concern among residents. 
so we view this as a gateway to providing a deeper, uh, to connecting buildings to deeper audit opportunities, to deeper energy efficiency opportunities. And the Cambridge pilot consists of sponsoring a one-time heating tune-up pilot, uh, a one-time heating tune-up for 10 buildings in the city. So we've marketed it to all multifamily buildings in Cambridge of 10 or more units. Uh, that's about 450 properties if, to, to ballpark it. Uh, they must have centrally meter heat to be eligible, um, but they must also be gas fired. So we have a little bit of um, oil fired multifamily heat in the city and, and that's really kind of difficult to tune up. Uh, we find that WeGoWise was a, uh, a great platform to engage buildings with as well as uh, of course our benchmarking building population. And we are partnering with a company called New Ecology. They're a, a green design engineering firm in downtown Boston and they're providing the service and they're also providing sort of the evaluation of buildings as they come in to, to determine eligibility. After the tune-up is completed, New Ecology is also going to provide each owner with a follow-up report uh, detailing next steps. If, you know, they, aren't, they don't have the capacity to do a full you know, ASHRAE level two audit of the heating system while they're there, uh, but they can point out uh, appropriate programs to take advantage of, um, as well as maybe some obvious measures such as uh, looking into, you know, uh, insulation for the heating pipe risers and things like that. So a tune-up really starts with data. Um, engineering, uh, you know, the engineers at New Ecology need to evaluate 12 months of heating data as well as the system characteristics. Uh, and we want to evaluate the results of the pilot by looking at data after one heating season or ideally after a full year. So we created a uh, Google form for the application, uh, very easy to use uh, link that we could send out and you know uh, include as a link in any uh, snail mail type of outreach. It has four to six fields that ask about when your boiler was last upgrade, uh, last tuned, um, what, you know, how many units you have, uh, things like that, uh, what the heating distribution system is. And we created four pathways for buildings to share their energy use data. So if they had already had WeGoWise, they could basically check off a box that says, I authorize WeGoWise to share my data with New Ecology, uh, you know, easy enough. If they were in portfolio manager, um, that was very easy uh, for them to just sort of send their data to us through an existing uh, data share um, or in a data share of their existing account. Uh, but for buildings that didn't have either of these, we wanted to uh, provide two other sort of electronic uh, means of sharing data, uh, data. One was if they could fill out an Excel spreadsheet with their therms used each month for 12 months and really as a last priority, a last resort, they could send their scan of bills. And so we launched this in October. So uh, observations uh, after about 22 applications received, uh, we have had data shared successfully through all four channels. This does really demonstrate the data hurdles as well though. Uh, we've seen condo residents that are really interested you know, in participating the, the, the trustees or their unit owners, uh, but they have trouble accessing bills for management. Uh, we've also seen that portfolio manager sharing, while you know in the end it works really well, it does require a, a, a fair amount of back and forth coordination to make sure you're finding the right person in the contact directory. They accept your invite and you, sh you know, share the building, things like that. Um, we have seen that property managers, especially in some of the smaller building stock, uh, keep track of the financial totals. But when it's you know if, if asked for therms, uh, which is the information that you really need. Uh, they're sending over a stack of bills that are scanned together. And really what we're seeing is this sort of capacity or um, data capability difference between larger buildings, not just the, you know, not just the ones that are covered by benchmark ordinances, but maybe around that sort of 30 unit plus range, they have portfolio manager or similar um, tool, whereas below that, this is, it seems like this is some of the first time uh, first times that they're actually tracking energy use. Uh, we have seen on a positive note that the buildings that are going through the tune-up that don't have a tool are actually really interested in WeGoWise because they want to see the uh, performance, you know, pre and post tune-up. And for us, uh, we'll be looking at that post tune-up data to evaluate the results of the pilot.
So just to wrap up, um, going ahead into 2017, we'll be evaluating the pilot programs. These are you know, one-year programs under the sort of purview of participating in the Georgetown Prize. But if there are successful lessons learned um, and successful components of the pilots, we absolutely want to scale them and, and uh, look for ways to implement them for more buildings. Uh, we're also going to be participating in a pilot with Eversource. Uh, Eversource is rolling out a whole building approach to multifamily efficiency with sort of a energy action plan covering all building systems. Um, they're doing that throughout their service territory in Massachusetts, um, but we want to make sure we can uh, partner with them on outreach and uh, coordinate uh, with them on uh, solar assessment so that buildings that are pursuing efficiency are also plugged into the city's uh, free solar assessment and uh, you know, solar program right now. Uh, so that's about it. Um, thank you for joining, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, uh, we will open it up to Q&A now. If you want to submit questions through the webinar function, through the chat function, we'll address that. Um, we do apologize for the audio issues at the beginning of the webinar, and um, sorry if that was garbled. The, there will be a recording of the webinar available, and we'll also have a PDF of the slides available as well, and you should get those in a follow-up email after the webinar. So if you have any questions, please feel free to submit them, and we'll take a look at them. We did have a quick question about the name of the energy guide being used for new tenants that Megan referenced in relation to Austin, Texas. Yeah, so that's the City of Austin and Austin Energy through its energy conservation and disclosure laws. They require owners to give residents an energy guide. It's called Energy Guide for Prospective Tenants. Um, so you can uh, probably Google it and find it there, or you can look at page 36 of the INT report, and it's, there's a link to, uh, to that report there. So, um, so I have a question for Nikhil, if that's okay. Um, in, when you're, if you're a city thinking about enacting these programs, what are some of the key partnerships that you should be looking at to form within your jurisdiction? What's been critical for Cambridge? Yeah, <clears throat> um, I think first of all, it was, you know, we wanted to make sure we were. Um, building programs based on sort of existing lessons learned and our affordable housing uh, partners here at Homeowners Rehab, Cambridge Housing Authority, and Just to Start were uh, sort of the, um, you know, initial source of ideas for some of these programs, right? That this is how you could market it, this is some of the benefits we've seen of the heating tune-up, things like that. Um, it's also been really good to find um, project partners, you know, vendors and and technologists who are willing to think about these programs creatively to say, uh, you know, for example, New Ecology, if they're, you know, looking at a building that might not have the right uh, you know, type of controls in place already, that they're sort of willing to adapt a little bit and say, here's what we could do, here's, you know, here's some recommendations to put in those controls and then we can come back. So, you know, a little bit of flexibility in thinking about how we implement a program, uh, implement a new program, really. So I think that's having Wigawise and New Ecology on board um, has been uh, has been great. Thanks, Nikhil. So there is one question that came in about the pilot program, and um, one of the attendees wanted to know: Is the pilot only for heating, and is cooling harder to perform a tune-up and collect data? Um, that's a good question. I mean, so. It's only heating um, to start, and I should say it's also limited to building heating and not domestic hot water. Uh, we've heard that including hot water in the scope would really, um, it, to do hot water tune-ups correctly for large buildings was really going to add more cost uh, to each building visit. Um, cooling is something we could look at uh, in the future. Um, we haven't really explored that, but I do know we have really a pretty wide range of cooling systems in in Cambridge, ranging from uh, you know pretty much any 
a pre-1970s building that's going to have your window unit um, up to some of our larger, newer construction that's going to have central uh, chiller systems. So I think there would be sort of a broader range of technologies to work with. Great, thank you. So I think that's it for our questions today. Um, thanks everyone again for attending. As I mentioned, we'll make a recording of the webinar and a PDF of the slides available after this. And if you have any other follow-up questions or concerns, please feel free to reach out to us. Megan and Nikhil's contact information is shown on the screen. Um, and please do download the full report at imt.org backslash resources. And thank you again for joining us.